the apologies. Item number two, disposable uh, interests. <coughs> As I reminded that they must declare their disposable pecuniary interests in other registration or non-registration interests in any matter being considered at the meeting as set out in Appendix B of the Members Code of Conduct and consider if they should leave the room prior to that item being considered. Further advice can be sought from the monitoring officer in advance of the meeting. Um, uh, so I will be declaring an interest in item number 10. I will leave the room and take them or take them part of the debate and leave the room. Anybody else? Councillor Butler. Uh, Councillor Gwilym Butler, KB Mortimer, uh, pecuniary interest item number 10. I will not be taking part and will leave the, leave the room as I'm a local landlord. Thank you. Anybody else? Yep. Councillor C. Motley. Thank you, Leader. Yes, item number 10. I will not be taking any part in this. I will be leaving the room. Uh, my husband um, is a partner in Wenlock Estates, which rents properties. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rob Gittins. Uh, yes, uh, the uh, same Councillor Rob uh, Gittins. Uh, I'll be leaving the room. Um, I'll be declaring the interest for agenda uh, item 10 uh, as I'm a local property in the investor. Thank you, Councillor Gittins. We've also got Councillor Claire Wild in the room, who's the chairman of the performance scrutiny, who will be speaking about later in the agenda. Councillor Wild, do you wish also to declare? Great additional interest, not leave the room. Thank you very much indeed. So, unless there are any more, shows. moving on to item number three, the minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of June 2022. I'm happy to propose those minutes. Do I have a seconder? Oh, Thank you, Councillor Potter. All those in favour? Thank you very much. Moving on to item number four, public question time. We don't have any public questions today. So, moving on to item number five. <laughs> We do have some member questions, and certainly Councillor Reid Hatton has got a question, and she's joining us online. Councillor Reid Hatton, over to you. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for the comprehensive response to the question I submitted. Um, I'm Councillor Ruth Houghton from Bishop's Castle. I'd just like to ask supplementary, if I may. Um, I did think the response was very full and, and thorough, but how is all the support that's being made available being advertised to people? I've had a good look at the website um, that's that referenced in the response. Sadly, some of the local food bank details are out of date. And I'm also concerned that much of the help listed may be targeted at people in receipt of specific benefits. And I suspect now we're moving forward with people who are working and still on low incomes and who will also need that support. And will that support that's been listed be available to those people, please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Hatton. Um, the, the, sorry, the process normally for Cabinet is that you ask your question and the answer is read out to you. However, in this instance, um, I'm happy to move straight to your supplementary question. Uh, Councillor Jones? I'm not on, am I? You, you are now. Yeah, I am. Oh, right. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, if I can thank uh, Councillor Hatton for, uh, for the question. Um, we are doing some social media with partners uh, around this and developing a full communications plan with partners. So it is a, it's an ongoing job there. I think it's also fair to say, Councillor Hatton, unless any other cabinet members want to, I'll bring Councillor Butler in at the moment, that um, there is a trawl being done of all that information that's currently available for the cost of living things. We are aware that some of that information goes out of doubt out of date, sorry, very, very quickly. So um, what I would urge everybody here today is that um, to keep an eye on that information, because obviously our website is only as good as the information that we receive. So if you are aware that something is wrong, um, please get in touch with us immediately. Councillor Butler. Um, just to update cabinet and members, we have received another 560,000 discretionary fund for council tax support. Uh, we're working through with officers how that will be delivered, <coughs> but we are looking at it to be distributed to some of the people who have fallen through the net on the first floors, and it will be people who are on existing council tax support who may be in higher banding housing because it's been tested as well if they're renting, etc. And we'll also be topping up those who get. Um, council tax support at the moment at the time. As soon as we've got it finalised, I will put out a briefing to all members. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Helton. Thank you, Thank you, Thank um, you so very much. It's from Councillor Rob Wilson, who I can't be put the secretary of so um, I'm going to ask. Oh, no, Councillor David Jasmine, no doubt. 
indeed, indeed, indeed. Yes, it's me. Um, I'm the Congratulate Vice um, Archbishop of Rockwell Council, Rob Wilson. Um, I welcome the adoption of Fix My Street by Shropshire Council, which is much better than its predecessor, My Shropshire. How many road defects are currently outstanding on Fix My Street in Shropshire, including surface issues and potholes? Does this include reports that have been closed because they are in a future work programme? And why, when reports are closed on Fix My Street, because it's in the future work program. It's an estimated date for completion. Not Thank you, Councillor Voter, on behalf of Councillor Wilson to respond. Councillor Dean Carroll. Thank you, Leader Councillor Dean Carroll, Cabinet Member for Physical Infrastructure. Once again, thank you, Councillor Vasmer, for presenting one of Councillor Wilson's questions. This is becoming a bit of a, a bit of a theme of Cabinet meetings. There are currently 772 outstanding road, carriageway and pothole surface defects on Fixed My Street. This does not include defects that have been closed because they are on future work programme. At present, this one sort of automated as the service has not yet increased capacity to allow more detailed feedback. It is hoped to automate feedback about future work programmes. However, in Fix My Street does not currently have this functionality, but this is something that the Council are working with my society to actively develop. Thank you, Councillor Cameron. I should say that my society is the software company behind the <laughs> it's supplementary council <clears throat> Yeah, any sort of that idea of when that might become might become available? Well, if anybody who's ever developed any functionality for an existing complex app will tell you how long is a piece of string where you're developing um software um, with a complex base code underneath it. So no, I can't tell you at this moment in time that we will have an estimated date for that to be embedded and operational. I can tell you, Councillor Vasma, that it's not just this council that's looking forward to that piece of functionality that, that affects councils right across the country. Uh, moving on to our uh, third question, which is from Councillor Reed Hatton. So Reed, if I could ask you to ask your question <laughs> and then um, uh, Councillor Carroll will respond to you. Yes, thank you, Chair, and apologies from the first no question. Um, how many schools in Shropshire are now benefiting from a 20 mile per hour speed limit on roads outside their gates? And what is a planned rollout programme for those schools not yet included in the 20 mile per hour speed limit programme? Thank you, Councillor Hutton. Councillor Dean Carroll. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Councillor Hutton, for the question. In September 2020, Shropshire Council approved the development of a programme for reducing 20 mile per hour speed restrictions outside of schools. I thank you, Councillor Morris, for bringing the original motion to Council that triggered that, um, triggered that decision. Where existing highway conditions suggest it would be appropriate. The last review in 2021 suggested that 22 schools in Shropshire already had mandatory 20 mile per hour speed restrictions in place. A programme of data collection and feasibility work associated with the introduction of mandatory 20 mile per hour speed restrictions commenced in May 2021, with a view to formulating a provisional programme of capital work to commence in financial year 2022 to 23. A significant programme of data collection has been carried out at all state funded maintained schools and academies that do not currently have a mandatory 20 mile per hour speed limit to specifically understand traffic behaviour at the start and end of the school day and to determine an appropriate level of intervention. There is no single generic approach for the introduction of a mandatory 20 mile per hour speed restriction and site specific characteristics determine the level of intervention that may be required and the degree of benefit that may be achieved. In some circumstances, this may be physical traffic calming to slow vehicle speeds, in others, current conditions may suggest that a 20 mile per hour speed restriction is unnecessary and would deliver minimal benefits. Officers are currently waiting for a date for the approach taken for the feasibility work, options, assignment and prioritisation of schemes to be reviewed by the community's overview and scrutiny committee before publicising the forward programme of scheme design and delivery. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carroll. Councillor Hamm, do you have a supplementary? Uh, yes, please, Chair. Um, really to push for when that date will be going to scrutiny. Um, we're now three months into the new financial year and I do think it's really important that we can push on with this. I mean, certainly in this area, there are primary and nurseries, nursery schools on 60 mile per hour roads. Um, one would hope that would be a priority, but obviously the data has to be reviewed first. Thank you, Councillor Hamm. Councillor Carroll, do you have a 
Thank you, Councillor Houghton. Councillor Carroll? I couldn't agree with you more, Councillor Houghton, about it being a priority. However, it's not for me as a cabinet member to dictate to the scrutiny committees what is on their work programmes. So perhaps that's a question you need to take up with the chair of the community's overview and scrutiny. Uh, uh, thank you, Councillor Carroll. I've got um, Councillor Carroll, well, chair of on the scrutiny. Yes, um, I think actually it came to performance and there's a task and finish group set up and Rob Wilson is a member. Uh, I've got four meetings organised, so when we go through the process we'll actually bring it back to, I presume, performance management group. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like it's already going through the task and finish process yeah. anyway. Okay, thank you very much and thank you Claire for that. So, neatly, moving on to item number six, which is actually scrutiny out and is Councillor Claire Wild. Thank you, my name is Claire Wild, I'm the Councillor for Seven Valley. I'm Chair of the Performance Management Scrutiny and Vice Chair of the People Overview Committee. Uh, I'm here today to update you because uh, on the 29th of June, I actually chaired the People's Overview Committee. Uh, and I wanted um, Cabinet's backing for, for what we agreed to do. Ruth was there, I see her nodding. Um, so item six on the agenda were the Children and Young People's Men Mental Health Partnership, where we had a, a briefing from the CCG. Um, the committee decided to unanimously reject the report. <laughs> Uh, because we weren't satisfied with it at all. There was no performance data, there was no outcomes. Uh, during the conversation, uh, I think the person in charge was called yeah. Miller, Miller Bowness. Uh, and what we agreed was that I would meet with him and I would draw up some performance indicators because, um, as people will be aware, uh, the CCG really is no more. We've got the integrated care uh, system service uh, and as part, the, as part of that uh, there's a whole process involved and part of that fortunately is uh, performance and, uh, and output driven. So I wanted to, uh, us to, to take part in that and actually come up with some performance data that is relevant to uh, our people and young children in, in Shropshire. So I wanted to, to just raise that with, with Cabinet now so that you are aware of uh, what's going on. Once we've done that, we're going to bring it back to Performance Management Scrutiny Committee for them to have a look at it. We're also going to do uh, a joint uh, uh, joint meeting between people and performance management because there are a tremendous amount of issues, there's a tremendously long list, so we won't get it done in one meeting. However, it's important we start, and it's important that we get these key performance indicators there. Thank you, Councillor Ward. I think, you know, from, from the Cabinet's perspective, I think this does show, and hopefully Ruth being on that committee as well, this does show that, you know, we are going to be looking much deeper into our relationship with our house colleagues and how that is impacting on uh, Shropshire Council as an organisation, but also uh, impacting on, on the um, certainly on our, on our young people and other people who's, um, who rely on our house colleagues uh, for their well-being. So thank you, Claire. I, I know it wasn't an easy decision for you to, uh, well, I said it wasn't an easy decision. It's not a decision that was taken lightly uh, to, to refuse to accept that report. So, um, Cabinet, can I just have a show of hands that we're happy for, for it to go down this route? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Thank you. So, moving on now to item number seven, which is the financial outcome 2021 22. Councillor Gwilym Butler. Thank you, Linda. <coughs> Um, this, this budget was agreed in February 21. Little did we know the impact uh, worldwide of post-COVID supply chains, inflation and the awful war in Ukraine. It's already noted that inflation was already having an impact in quarter three of this historic financial strategy. Overall, the council ended the year better than expected. The year saw the use of control corridor, which indicates possible outcomes of between 9 million overspend and 2.5 million 
overspent against the agreed budget. The outturn ended up with a lower limit of this expectation, supported by the robust management action. The final outturn was better than forecast in the previous report, quarter three. Key variances included the overspended children's services, driven by demand, which was higher than anticipated in the budget. However, the Ofsted report has indicated that the overall framework for children's care is good. Let's not forget that. So our work must now focus on how to prevent the need, act early to minimise need and step down care rapidly, but more importantly, safely within the framework. Other overspending with offset by reducing financial financing costs as some of the capital schemes have slipped forward to latter years, and that slippage may, was outside of our control on most occasions. This is a good result overall for the Council, and positions as well to meet the challenges such as inflationary pressures in the new budget in 22-23, as well as further pressures in later years of the medium-term financial strategy. I am also pleased to report that we have prudently um, under budgeted and we have a surplus in our collection fund, circa 4 million for the financial year, which will act as a cushion and counteract this overspend and result to starting the 22-23 year in a surplus of 1.5 million. And I would like to thank all the finance team for their work they have done in delivering this. <coughs> With your um, time, Leader, I'd just like to comment. Moving forward, we are in uncharted waters, and I can advise Cabinet that the medium-term financial strategy will have to become far more agile, and I will be bringing an update, updated report to Cabinet later this month on how we are reacting to the challenging times we are facing. Budget decisions will be made throughout the year if required, and not left until February to enable us to be far more reactive and controlling of budget and in a far more confident place in these evolving hard times. Furthermore, this is to advise all members that they can be involved in the changing financial uh, work through performance management scrutiny who can oversee any of the emerging strategy at any time. Leader, I move the recommendations A to K as listed in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, sorry, my mic was on. Thank you very much indeed, um, Councillor Butler. I'm very happy to, to second this report. Um, can I just draw members' attention to um, item K of the, of the recommendations, which sort of sits a little outside of, um, of the, the usual recommendations, but I just wanted to say how pleased I was to see that we received uh, or applied for and received significant funds from the LGA. Um, to enable us with our uh, work in food security. And I think that Councillor Ruth Houghton would like to speak on this matter as well. Councillor Ruth Houghton. Thank you, Chair. Ruth Houghton, Councillor for Bishop's Castle and in the southwest of the county. Um, again, really very pleased um, as you, Chair, to see the award of 300,000 coming into Shropshire for what is a really critical piece of work. I think um, what I'd really like to ask is, you know, what is the plan for how that money will be used? It's very welcome funding. If I can give some background, um, in Shropshire here at Bishop's Castle, um, the um, our food bank was only established right at the beginning of the pandemic within a week of the 24th of June compared to last year and this year, the use has risen by 70%. Imagine that happening across the whole of South West Shropshire or indeed Shropshire and the demand that's there. And of course, we all know that food insecurity isn't just linked to lack of food, but high fuel costs, again, rural community, no cap on um, solid fuel or oil, which is what most people rely on rather than gas and electric limited public transport, higher costs at the fuel pump. So really very welcome funding. But how is it going to be used? I mean, the, that, that's sort of missing from the report. I would hope it would be worthy of a, a separate report giving details for that, because um, it, is, it is really critical that we do this. And I would urge members, if you've not read the Health Watch report on to food insecurity, that you need to do so. Because, for example, a shopping basket of goods in Ludlow costs £18.51. 
the same amount purchased in Clun costs £43.69. That's fine if you're just buying emergency, you know, corner shop type products, but it's a huge difference if you're buying a weekly shop, which many people have to due to lack of public transport. So how this money will be spent, I really think is critical that needs that needs to be shared with both the public and um, particularly with members as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howland. Councillor Buck, are you aware of how that money is, is being deemed? I sort of agree with Councillor Howland that perhaps a separate update for members would be. I don't, to be truthful, but I can get more further information. But I totally agree with Ruth's comments. Yeah. Um, and I think it might be something worthy of the Central Task and Finish Group looking at it, or even scrutiny. Yeah. On an ongoing basis. And I think There's certainly a lot of learning to be done there. Yeah, certainly. And I, I think we, we, we will ask for that um, to, to come before. I think perhaps the social task force first, actually. Um, Tony's not here. She's online. She's online. Um, let me just see. Rachel, uh, are you aware of how this is? You are. Thank you. So Rachel Robinson will answer the question. Thank you, Rachel. Sorry, is my is it working? My microphone yeah, working? Yeah, fine. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm just absolutely happy, very happy. This should come through the social task force, and very happy to take that this through that route. If that's if everyone's in agreement around that. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. I mean, the one thing I was going to say is that if you know if we can get this to work in 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 the southwest, and we can find more monies, then we can roll it out across the rest of Shropshire. Mm -hmm. Councillor David Rathman. Yeah, Sharon, I welcome this. Um, uh, very much so. But the only th the only thing I've noted, note I've placed it a negative note is that um, I don't think uh, councillors in the southwest were aware of this until it appeared in the capital agenda. Um, and I think it would have been useful to have actually notified them in advance about, about this. If that's uh, it, you know, because I think um, that these are, these initiatives are very very good and very well to welcome. I've had um, similar experiences in my own ward, but do we need to get, get more information out as to when these are coming forward? Thank you, Councillor Rosner. I've got lots of nodding heads going on to the my right, Councillor Carroll. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Vassar, I was the portfolio holder for health and social care when this project was taken forward and the local members were all given a briefing at the time that we put in the application for it. That was one of the conditions upon which I signed it off and I know it has since been back to health and wellbeing board for progress reports. Um, so as far as I'm aware, local members in the southwest of Shropshire were certainly aware of it and if not having bespoke progress reports, certainly had access to progress reports that were taken through the health and wellbeing board. Thank you, Councillor Bassman. Yes, thanks. Now, what I was concerned about was the fact that we did, people didn't know it was coming forward to Cabinet today. <coughs> I'm aware that people have been consulted about it, I'm aware that there has been some involvement, but they weren't, um, people weren't aware that it was coming forward to Cabinet. I think that it would, because obviously it's in the, you, you wouldn't know if it was in the in the paper because of this financial outturn um, document and re only at the, right at the end I realised this this was this was being being um, debated today. Uh, yes, please, uh, James Morton. Just very quickly, um, it's a it's a constitutional requirement that we bring it to cabinet to whenever we are a setting up an accountable body uh, on behalf of the local body. So it's purely Cabinet to approve the scandal body has no indication whatsoever for what that grant is about, what it's spent on, or whatever. It's good to get agreement with the cabinet that's scandal body. Thanks, James. Actually, I thought I should have made that clear. Yeah, it's about set market. We're just not about the training that's in itself. So, um, but nevertheless, that's the bottom. Yeah, I, I, I totally get what Ruth is saying about everything. And I think, and I know the difference in the cost of the shopping baskets. And um, it's a double edged sword because, on the one side, you want to support the local economy, but part of this process may be to get ensure that these people have access to the internet to do online shopping for online deliveries so they get the best value. So, the you know, enterprise house and all places like that, if you can't afford the internet, how we can work in that bigger holistic picture, but at the same time supporting local businesses. As I say, this is this is about setting up that accountable body, but we'll take it through, as Rachel said, through the social transport room, which I think you sit on anyway. So. Okay, thank you. So, Councillor Buckley. 
Yeah, thank you. If I can just take it back to the other body of the report. I was very pleased to hear from Councillor Butler that the overall situation was a surplus. But going back to the detail that's presented in the report, the revenue budget um, describes the overspend of 2.5 million, which although it caught up from the previous quarter, it's still not a desirable position. Um, point B explains that this is below the recommended level for the general fund balance. So what implications does this have for our uh, sign off from auditors who for two years running cannot give us assurances? That's my first question. A second question, if you don't mind, um, is that the, the data in this report really has happened before inflation has kicked in. And um, what we're going to do going forward, especially if we do have a two year settlement, which on the one hand sounds like really welcome news, <laughs> but what happens if you fix your settlement and inflation continues to bite? Thank you. Thanks, guys, with that. You can sort of about that. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, on, on the revenue side of the two and a half million, um, obviously it was disappointing that we didn't get that down to budget. And as I said in my preamble, it was very much about that inflation was started to kick in pre to Christmas. Um, and so obviously when we set this budget nine months previously, we hadn't accounted for five, six percent sort of December inflation. So that was the issue there. In respect of the auditors, um, this is quite um, a chicken and egg scenario with our auditors because um, part of the signing off process through, through the accountants is there is there isn't an agreement with the SIPFA body on how they should be signed off. And so there is negotiations ongoing. Generally, um, I think we are in, in, a, in a reasonably good position, but we are stuck. We are stuck between the um, agreements between SIPFA and our, our accountants. I don't know if James wants to come in to say anything on that. Um, inflation. It is a worry and you'll notice in my last uh, paragraph that I've said that we've got to be far more agile. I, I strongly believe that this year's budget is going to have circa 8 million already put on top of it. If inflation carries on as it is, and it is going to be a challenge. And that's why I've also mentioned that we might have to bring budgetary decisions forward to, to create further revenue or save costs. It's going to be hard, Julia. That's all I'm going to be saying. But we need to be as agile and confident in delivering this as we can. But very relevant points. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's, I'll bring you in a moment, David. I think it's, it's worth saying that um, we've started really early in this process, far earlier than any, to my knowledge, any administration has before. I mean, we, we literally have started on next year's budget before this year's budget was, if you get my drift, um, we have the impact rate from what we've already started on the following financial year. So we know it's going to be, you know, everybody's suffering the same things. James, is there anything you want to clarify about the particular situation regarding reserves? I'm also aware of course, that this is coming to the council tomorrow, so. Yeah, so a um, couple of things then. So uh, in terms of the voice assurance, if you're talking about external uh, audit, then uh, we're still awaiting, uh, as Council Butler said, um, we are still awaiting guidance to be signed off. Um, uh, SIPFA, the accounting body, have uh, provided that guidance. Uh, it's currently being consulted on until that is signed off. No authority in the country that has not yet had it signed, it's had signed off can. Um, so we're just waiting for that final uh, uh, agreement to be held and then that will be completed. Uh, in relation to the inflation, um, Council Butler again has been very clear on that. Um, we are bringing a new uh, financial strategy report forward uh, to Cabinet on the 20th of July, um, purely to set out what that position looks like because it's significantly different to uh, the position the Council approved um, back, in, uh, back in February. Um, it won't be making any decisions. Per se, it would just be resetting the position so that we understand where that is and, and how we can ensure that the, uh, the £8 million plus estimated inflation for this year uh, will be managed and dealt with uh, within this, uh, within this uh, uh, financial year. And in relation to the uh, overturn uh, within this year and the impact that has on the general fund balance, um, as uh, Councillor Bottler has said, that two and a half million will be taken on the general fund balance at the end of this year, but then because of the collection fund service on council tax and business rates, um, that will then be credited back in the new year. So it's only for basically overnight. Thank you, James. Very clear as usual. Thank you much. Come back. Yeah, just a, a welcome. I welcome uh, Councillor Butler's statement because I felt that um, recently he's um, issued a press release which to my mind, underestimated the scale of the problem we face, because if you look at it, we've got a £4 million sort of 
um, uh, a structural deficit. We've got close to 11 million of inflation to cope with. We've got 11 million of reserves. We, we're really getting into a situation where it's getting very, very serious. And I'm, I'm concerned about it, just like everybody else. But I'm glad that, that um, you, know, you are taking action to, to deal with this early this time. Thank you, David. So, I have a proposer, I have a seconder. All those in favour? Thank you. And thank you. And I echo my um, thanks to the finance team too, because I know that's been, <coughs> been an, an interesting ride over the last 12 months. Um, moving on to item number eight, performance monitoring report, quarter four. Um, I invite Councillor Rob Gittings. Thank you very much, uh, Leader. Uh, Councillor Rob Gittings, Portfolio Hoard for Digital Data Insight and Bill Housing. Um, overall overall um, performance in quarter four is still uh, positive. Ten measures show an improvement in their performance. Seven measures remain at the same level. Five measures show a decline. Um, all, all of the visitor numbers to the culture and leisure facilities have shown a, com a, a continued increase following the lockdown periods. Um, household waste figures remain on target. The number of houses on the council tax valuation list has increased by 1,593 during the last year. The number of premises which have gained access to superfast broadband via the Connecting Shopping Programme has also been increased. And during quarter four, children's services were subject to an offset inspection, which came back with a rating of good. Moving forward, the quarter four performance report is the last in this format. From uh, 2022 to 2023, a new performance management framework has been launched to align with the newly uh, adopted structure plan. There have been conversations with members through the scrutiny process to identify the key performance indicators that members want to um, con consider. Alongside this delivery, uh, these delivery plans are being pulled to a get under the structure plan uh, strategic objectives and these delivery plans will identify key indicators to enable the organisation to monitor progress towards approved outcomes. The performance management framework will involve over the coming 12 months as more measures and, uh, are identified and baselined uh, and targets are established. But in the first instance, and although it will be complete, members will begin to see and shape what the future will look like from the quarter one uh, period. So if I could ask Cabinet to consider and endorse recommendations A, B and C as laid out in section two of the Cabinet paper. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Gittins. Do I have a second that Councillor Butler? Um, yes, thank you for bringing this paper forward, Rob. It, it, I think it's, it's, it's very um, apt that we're talking about this after the conversation we've just had about the budget. So I think it's vital that we get performance monitoring correct mm -hmm. and agile so we as members can see it. We can just click in and look at it almost on a daily or weekly basis so we can understand where the pressures are and be far more re reactive and agile. So I look forward to working with you with on this and, and with members of that group in the decision making of what we need to look at to influence where the money goes effectively. So yeah, thank you Rob. Thank you Councillor Potter. Um, well, I know these reports come sort of periodically, but it's quite useful to start to highlight a bit of the planning performance uh, and seeing a marked improvement in the planning service um, and delivering a number of large applications um, through. So, and I know there's a lot of talk about this amongst members, and I'd encourage all members to um, delve into the into the data here uh, to actually get a, a picture of what is what is happening. And um, obviously, just wanted to highlight a positive news story from uh, the the planning portfolio. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Potter. I mean, there, I think that's it. Even, you know, it's not been the easiest of 12 months, but there has been improvements in areas. I think the one thing that I would highlight before Councillor Hurst and I does um, is that, you know, we continue to see um, a significantly high focus of uh, in looked after children in areas. And I think it's fair to say that there is a significant amount of work going on uh, into that at the moment. So, you know, I, I think it, it, it's a good report, but like Councillor Gittins has said, I'm keen that we get real meaningful key performance data so that members that can easily understand them and perhaps more importantly, so can members of the public. So thank you. Okay, 
no questions in the room. I have both that. I have a second that. All those in favour, please. Thank you very much. Moving on, Councillor Willem Butler, show today. Um, item number nine, Treasury Management Update for the floor. Um, thank you, Leader. This should hopefully just be a short one for noting. The Treasury team generated an additional investment income of 152,800 during the last quarter and outperformed their benchmark. Bank rates increased again to 1.25% in June. I think they will rise um, again over the next six months to try and bring inflation under control. Um, borrowing rates likely to increase for the remainder of this year and next year. However, the long term view is they will not remain high in the medium term. All Treasury and Prudential indicators continue to be complied with, and more detailed economic update can be found in Appendix D. Um, I'd quite simply, uh, Leader, just like to move the recommendation. Members are asked to accept the position as set out in the report and raise any questions or comments they have in respect of it. And I'd like to say thank, my, thank the um, officers and the Treasury team for an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Butler. Do I have a second for that? Councillor Potter. Councillor Potter. I have no hands in the room, so I propose that I have a seconder. All those in favour? Thank you very much. So, as I said earlier on, I will skip over item number 10 and take that at the end of the agenda. So, moving on to item number 11, draft empty home strategy for consultation. Councillor Rob Eatons. Uh, thank you very much, Leader. Uh, Councillor Rob uh, Dissons again, uh, Portfolio Holder for Digital Data Insight and Built Housing. Um, the uh, draft home strategy provides an overview of the numbers of empty homes in Shropshire, why homes can be uh, come empty, and how empty homes mm -hmm. are a wasted media source. In, in the, importantly, the draft strategy provides a policy framework setting out current processes for uh, identifying empty homes. Um, current and future EU initiatives to bring empty homes back into use and the range of enforcement activities that subject to a assessment and sufficient media sources can be considered. In order for the housing market to function and due to issues and circumstances such as major repair works, pro rebate or people receiving care, a, um, a proportion of homes will always be empty. Although not a strategy requirement, it is recognised as good practice to have an empty home strategy, yeah. um, especially to bring long term empty homes back in, in there to use. Uh, and a uh, empty home strategy provides a policy framework setting out the advice and assistance that can be provided uh, to bring empty homes back into use and the enforcement powers which could be used where empty homes are unsafe or are visibly blighting a your neighbourhood. With the respect to enforcement powers, there is often a misconception that councils can easily take enforcement action against a uh, empty uh, property owner so uh, that a dwelling, uh, a dwelling is brought back into use, notwithstanding the high cost of uh, the high cost in, in, the, in the applications of the enforcement action itself. It can be a very resource in the intensive and lengthy progress. As in April 2022, Shropshire had 1,475 dwellings, or 0.9% of the dwelling stock, which had been empty for over six months. Of these, 572, or 0.4% of the dwelling stock, had been empty for over two years. Almost 90% of these dwellings are privately owned and are dispersed throughout the county, rather than concentrated in, their, in certain locations. The draft empty home strategy has four main objectives. Maintain relevant, accurate and current information relating to empty homes in the area. Bring empty homes back into use through encouragement, advice and a, a assistance. But all other um, uh, negotiations has failed to consider options for taking the appropriate enforcement action to ensure empty homes are brought back into use and raise awareness of, empty, of the empty home strategy with residents, uh, dwelling, dwelling owners and town and parish councils. The draft empty home strategy seeks to highlight the reasons for why homes are empty, the advice the council can offer and the initiatives it is exploring to assist um, owners of empty homes. 
the draft strategy also sets out uh, the range of enforcement activity the council could look over uh, uh, potentially consider um, subject to sufficient resources and uh, a, a associated policy approach. Cabinet is therefore asked to approve that the draft MTM strategy is subject to an eight week uh, long public consultation. This consultation will also include town and parish councils. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Gittins. Do I have a second to that? Yeah, I'm uh, Councillor Simon Jones, Paul Ferry Holder for Adult Social Care and Public Health. I'm uh, pleased to uh, second the uh, recommendation there and thank Councillor Gittins for this report. Thank you, Councillor Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to raise one issue, a um, small issue, really, because you know, as you said in your introduction, Councillor is that 90% of um, NHS are privately owned. But there is a 10% um, issue, and that's sometimes to do with housing associations in rural areas who don't always um, get their properties um, tenanted as soon as quickly as possible. And sometimes, and some, there are some examples where they've actually sold properties in rural areas, reducing the amount of uh, available um, housing for local people. And I wondered whether in this, in this, um, whether in this policy, there is some, something to, I'm not so to shame housing associations, but certainly to identify where that, where that is, where there are anti property groups around by housing associations. Yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Balsma. Um, yes, I think it's widely a, a, a appreciated that sometimes um, um, housing associations do um, sort of hold on to stock. Um, I, I think what's important to uh, note is that um, um, we will always lobby um, um, these housing associations to make sure they bring the stock back in to use uh, as fast as possible. Um, Unfortunately, though, we do have quite limited powers in, in these areas, but we will, uh, we will, of course, uh, do all for that we can. Thank you. Councillor Buckley. Thank you. <clears throat> I was actually going to thank you for the element whereby you're wanting to reach out to social animals such as Star Housing to explore the opportunity to purchase. So the purchase and repair scheme for those uh, that you want to bring back into use. As you're aware, STAR and other social landlords are looking for additional land to try to close the gap because we've got a net loss of 40 um, uh, social housing every year because of the right to buy, which has recently been escalated. So I think it's really welcome. And um, on an anecdotal level, speaking to residents who own an empty property, um, sort of, it won't be their first communication, but one of their first communications was a rather stern letter with a big bill saying that the council tax is now going up to 200% and they're now in debt. So I really welcome the steps that you outlined around the communication. I would recommend that that be brought forward even sooner. So rather than waiting for six months to contact what appears to be the empty property and explain that after six months, they will be presented with options and that if they wish a conversation earlier to do so, because Often it can be through people passing away and then the probate can leave people sometimes really strapped financially and so offering support rather than a penalty bill. I think actually we'll get many more positive responses. So it's a plea that you just bring forward that even sooner in your comments. Thank you. Yeah, and I would certainly make that point too if, if, if um, you're going to respond to the consultation. I think that's a, that's a very valid point indeed. Um, I should say that there is um, Councillor Carroll will know this. Um, we've had some very um, robust discussions around um, bringing uh, the, the selling of properties um, that are very much in sometimes in the rural areas. And they, you know, they, it's not decisions they take lightly, but we're trying very hard to persuade them not to do that. Um, for the simple reason that if you sell a property in the it, it does all seem to impact on the south. In the south of the county, it's very difficult to put one back. Um, but obviously, sometimes these properties cost so much to bring back into uh, into a, into a good standard that it makes it very difficult. For them. But believe you me, we are having those conversations, and I think robust is is a good word. So we'll go along with that one. That's what about that. Yeah, um, a really useful conversation. I take David Basmar's point because in February we've had a, a, a couple of properties. They're usually the old prefabs or, or single cavity 
um, ex council stock from the 50s, um, which aren't financially viable to be brought back to modern standard when the next one, the next door has already been done privately. Um, the interesting thing is when they've been put on the market, they've often taken two or three years to sell because they're unmortgageable. So that, that's another issue. <laughs> the only thing I wanted to actually um, bring forward and make members aware, this is in the forward plan for us to review the whole council tax um, um, in, in charging policy on empty homes. And I think there may well be some cross pollination we've got to do between the two documents, if that makes sense. And I welcome all the consultation from all members. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Yeah. I wonder if they're still struggling to sell. Because I don't, I don't see four sale balls staying up very long at the moment, um, but hey ho. So I have a proposal, I have a second there. All those in favour of sending yes. the consultation, thank you very much indeed. Uh, moving on to item 12, which is Gypsy and Traveller Gypsy and Traveller Transit Site. Councillor Dean Carroll. Thank you, Leela. This is the next step in the process that was launched out of consultation in 2020. Um, in fact, it was the cabinet meeting before the first lockdown. Um, I fear that maybe it was slightly um, overshadowed by the events of the following weeks. However, we did extend the um, consultation period of that to enable people who were affected by the first lockdown to still have their input into it. There were 55 consultation responses. They are detailed in Appendix 3. This is a site that, well, this is a provision that we needed to provide in accordance with the local plan that was adopted in 2015-16. So it's something that we really do have to do, um, especially now as we're looking into the adoption of, looking at the adoption of the next iteration of the local plan, which is currently uh, inspectors reviews stage. So I will propose recommendations 4.1 to 4.4 and I'm open to questions. Thank you Councillor Carroll. Do I have a seconder? Thank you Councillor Carroll. Do I have a seconder for this report? I'm happy to second that Councillor Potter. Thank you very much. I have no questions in the room. All those in favour? I've got a proposal seconder. All those in favour? Thank you very much. Moving on to item sorry, my computer's just come back. Item number 13, parking charges and restrictions. Once again, I ask Councillor Dean Carroll to present the report. Thank you, Leader. These are the um, proposed charges that were included within the budget back in the February 2022. Council meeting that were adopted. We're just putting those into place. The reason for this coming back to four councillors that in order to change or vary car parking charges, we have to do it through the process of a TRO, a traffic regulation order, and that has to go out to consultation. That has now been out to consultation, and we're in a position to come back to you know, the cabinet to seek approval um, to go ahead with that. There's only one recommendation, that's 3.1, and that is to approve the charges as were previously agreed within the, the budget for the year. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Canada. I have a second to that. Councillor Bob Gittins, have a second. Thank you, Councillor Gittins. Julia. Thank you, just a couple of questions. Um, I noticed that the rates were, the increase was set at the rate of inflation on the date of the report, so I wasn't sure whether that was 17th of January or February, but how will that play out as inflation obviously is already increased significantly and probably will continue to do so? And I just have two comments really, if that's okay. Uh, one is that we're already experiencing on what I would call a school street, it's not a school street, roads around schools. Uh, we're just noticing more displacement parking of commuters not prepared or able to pay parking fees. So as the cost of living is rising, they're choosing to park on the street, which is impacting behaviours on schools. So I just mentioned that because as we're taking a piece of work around school streets, that conversation will come back to you. And my final comment is, um, I was going to make the suggestion, but I've been beaten to it in 8.3 by Worthen and Shell Parish Council, which is, I recall at one of the four council meetings, Rob, 
Wilson wanted us to have sort of a levy of 1% from the highways budget to go on active travel. And our members were wondering whether perhaps for future increases on car parking, and I know that you might do it in a review, whether an additional percentage could be levied onto car parking and that be set aside and replaced for active travel budgets. But I noticed that this parish council suggested something. Thank you. So three things in there. The first one, uh, I'll take them in reverse order. So that we, at the moment, we're guided by our strategy in law. We have to follow what our car parking strategy says the money is there for. And currently that says the money is there for the maintenance of the car parking estate. As I previously committed to, the um, the car parking strategy is due to be reviewed and I will send it forward for review and that will be the point at which we can decide if we want to increase the breadth of areas that we can look at for funding through car parking charges. However, that has to be by law within the highway service, but we do also need to bear in mind that if we are to increase or if we are to increase the number of services being funded by the car parking um, revenue, the, that in turn means higher charges down down the line. So we need to balance that off against each other. What was the um, the middle point you, you raised? Displacement, displacement, displacement of because of cost of living. So, so in terms of displacement, as you will know, Councillor Buckley and Councillor Hurst might as well, we're currently undertaking our first um, follow it under the current car parking strategy period into residence parking permits and that is in Bridge North mm -hmm. and so that has proven to be, should we say, lively in terms of consultation responses as for a couple of weeks they dominated my inbox in a way that I haven't seen from, um, from car parking matters for a long time. So we are and within our current strategy, we have the the ability to uh, to take steps on that. However, as you will have seen from the level of consultation responses and the the great variation in responses, that that isn't necessarily a straightforward win-win. Um, solution but that is something where if it's right in a specific location we will take it forward the first point that you made around inflationary increases in charges well the current the current car parking strategy says that we will review charges periodically and this is the first um, series of charge increases that we've introduced since sorry, 2018 when when this plan uh, when this car parking strategy was first introduced. So I'm not making a proposal under, under the, it wouldn't fit in with this strategy that we would suddenly look to, to make a second round of increases in the current financial year because of the rising cost of inflation. I'm very clear that any changes that we make in the car parking service moving forward have to be linked to a full car park strategy review that will be coming forward and I've already committed that that will be coming through through the scrutiny process through the scrutiny green paper process that will be happening um, but I don't believe it's right for us to be at this point talking about further in-year financial increases due to due to inflation. Thanks Councillor Cowan. I think it's also worth saying that um, Cabinet is pretty committed when it comes to looking at a car parking strategy review, that it's not just a car parking strategy review, but it's a review that is linked to the whole of the, the transport system. Um, it's a big piece of work which needs proper results in, I have to say. Yeah, certainly to Councillor Kirsten Knights. Excuse me, I'm used to my voice, Councillor Kirsty Hurst, my portfolio, Heart of Children and Education. Uh, you know, we heard from Ruth Hunter, Councillor Ruth Hunter earlier, obviously, it's straight from the schools with the 20 miles per hour because it comes on the highways, but I attend all the briefings. Just really, you know, to point out that we are slightly delayed because of COVID. No, 
when schools return, they weren't at full capacity, they weren't always open, but to capture the data, we really needed schools to be back to normal. So we're looking at every school in, in the county. So we are slightly de delayed, but we are working with all the education providers to capture the data accurately. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Knight. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so I have a proposal, I have a second that all those in favour. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That report is uh, passed. So all those of us who need to leave the room for item 10, would you like to leave the room? And I'll ask Councillor Ed Foster to come and take over the chair. Thank you. Uh, right, then item number 10 is a private. Oh, sorry. It's all right. I'm just about to do that. Yeah. Right. Don't make me throw myself over the mic for saying something like that. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's the same. Right then, uh, item number 10 is private rented sector housing enforcement policy. And it's uh, Councillor Simon Jones is going to present the report. Thank you, uh, Councillor Simon Jones, uh, portfolio holder for Adult Social Care and Public Health. Um, I'm uh, pleased to be able to uh, um, present this report. Uh, following um, uh, you know, the six week consultation that we had, uh, which resulted in limited feedback, but overall positive support for the policy, Cabinet are now asked to approve the implementation of the updated private rented sector housing enforcement policy. The enforcement policy specifically addresses, uh, in relation to private rented accommodation, the use of additional civil financial penalties for the purpose of improving the following. That's uh, electrical safety standards and minimum energy efficiency requirements. Uh, the extensions to the civil penalty powers um, can uh, means that we can impose civil penalties of up to £30,000 in respect of electrical safety standards and up to £5,000 for energy efficiency related matters. And it is for the council to determine the level of each civil penalty up to the maximum set in law. As far as determining the level of uh, civil penalties, uh, to ensure the uh, penalties are used fairly and set as an appropriate level, the policy sets out the factors that will be considered and the methods that will be used before a civil penalty is imposed. The factors are based on statutory guidance produced by government. Um, statutory responsibility on the council to regulate private rented domestic accommodation to ensure it is safe to live in, free from health and safety standard hazards, and meets the minimum energy efficiency level. The civil penalty powers are an additional enforcement tool aimed at tackling criminal, rogue and irresponsible landlords, improving standards in the private rented sector and to ensure that private rented accommodation is safe, well managed and the property is adequately maintained. The proposed policy supplements the Council's overall arching better regulations and enforcement policy. Now, before I move to the uh, recommendation at 3.1, I wish to make uh, an amendment to that uh, recommendation and cabinet members have actually received uh, an email copy of the uh, of the amendment, which is on page 18 of Appendix 1 of the Privately Rented Sector Housing Enforcement Policy. And uh, as a result of the Housing and Regulations, uh, re sorry, Regeneration Act 2008, all registered social landlords Housing associations regulated by the reg, uh, by the regulator of social housing became private registered providers and local authorities with housing stock, which includes Shropshire Council, became local authority registered providers. Whilst the term registered social landlord is still used, this is now legally incorrect. And for this reason, section 16 of the private rented sector housing enforcement policy needs to be amended. Uh, currently, the uh, uh, the document is uh, sort of presented uh, states at 16 housing association registered social landlords uh, 16.1 housing association registered social landlords published arrangements for reporting problems in clear response times for tenants addressing these issues 
If tenants feel the repairs have not been carried out to their satisfaction, each, each housing association registered social landlord has a complaints pr uh, procedure that the tenant should follow. As a result of this, the council will not normally investigate issues from housing association registered social landlord tenants unless the reporting and complaints procedures have been followed and the landlord has then failed to take appropriate action. Section 16 will be replaced now with uh, 16 housing associations, private registered providers of social housing. Uh, 16.1 housing associations, private registered providers of social housing have published arrangements for the reporting problems and clear response times for tenants addressing these issues. Uh, 16.2, if tenants consider that repairs have not been carried out to their satisfaction, each housing association, private registered provider of social housing has a complaints procedure that the tenant should follow. And 16.3, as a result of this, the council will not normally investigate issues from any tenant or housing association, private registered provider of social housing, unless the reporting and complaints procedure has been followed and the landlords have then failed to take appropriate action. And then obviously we would then follow on, uh, if they haven't uh, taken the appropriate action, we would then follow on with the details as in the uh, document. Uh, so I then move. Uh, the the moment. Moment. Yeah, just before I um, ask for a second, I just want to point out that although Leslie Pitton is present on the screen up there in terms of a picture, it's her laptop that's here, not her in the room, which is connected to a live event feed with a video sticker, so I don't want to disconnect anything in case I shut everything off. So just to confirm, Leslie isn't part of the meeting, um, and I'm not tech savvy enough to um, untangle the cables. So could I ask for a seconder for that uh, report, please? I'm sorry, no one's out second. Thanks very much. Any um, any comments on that? No one indicating. So can I have a show of hands, all those in favour? Carried, thank you very much. And that's it. The, that's the last agenda item and um, close the meeting. Thank you.